tonight we are here to discuss something that is probably one of the most frequent things I work with with my coaching clients. So to kick it off, and thank you all for dropping into the, <laughs> um, dropping into the chats where you're watching from. Um, if you see me do this a lot tonight, my chair is completely broken and, and the hydraulic does not want to keep me up. So um, I hope it's not distracting. <laughs> but do me a favor. In the chat, type the word me if you have things that you have always wanted to change or do differently, but you've always also run into a lot of resistance when you've tried to change it. Hey, Ellie, thanks for joining us. Hey, Wendy. So just type me into the chat if you have certain things that you've kind of always wanted to do, do differently, change about how you feel or change about how you, you've seen things in your life and very often ran into roadblocks with it. Wendy, I'm seeing you in there, me. Jennifer, thank you. Um, also, type the word, <laughs> Shirley says me. Um, also, type the word yes. If sometimes you find yourself doing or saying something that doesn't necessarily fit with your beliefs or your values, the fact you kind of go, man, why did I say that? Or why did I act that way? Or why did I do that? So type yes if you've had that experience where after you did something, after you said something, you kind of went, oh, man, that wasn't really how I wanted to handle that. Or that's not how I want to handle myself or things, um, say things. When he's saying these days, yes. All right, cool. Hey, from Long Island, New York, Stan. Good to see you. Lori's saying yes. Deborah's saying yes. Shirley's saying, oh my gosh, yes. Shirley's very enthusiastic tonight. William's saying yes. Awesome. So the good news is, is what you are experiencing <laughs> is that the human mind is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's the human mind in action. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is these specific things. And these things are really dictated by your subconscious. It's these things that you may have some subconscious agreements with that we can find and we can actually work with. So uh, again, good thing is, is if you did say yes to any of those things, just know the reason you said yes or the reason you said me is because you are completely and totally human. And if you didn't say yes, and you didn't say me, you're probably just not admitting it. <laughs> so let's talk about what it means to have subconscious agreements. <clears throat> we have this entire operating system that runs behind the scenes, and it's called our subconscious mind. The conscious mind, the, the part that actually used to process information consciously, that part really only uh, kicks into gear when it has to. And the reason for it is that that, that forward, more conscious mind, it takes a lot of energy to operate. How many of you type me in the chat if you have been to a class before and by the end of the day, you felt really like completely numb almost like, whoa, you just used all the energy that you could possibly use. So type me in the chat if you've been to a class before, a full day class, whether it's a haircutting class or something like that. Type me in the chat if you've gotten to the end of the day and experienced that kind of brain fog. And you can almost, I'm doing this because you can kind of feel it right here in the front, right, Stan? Yeah, Wendy. Ashanti, yes. So that feeling that you get is your prefrontal cortex, which is that conscious mind. It is being used so much in those classroom environments, so much more than a daily normal interaction, that it, it really uses so much energy. And that's why you feel that exhaustion. Ellie, you've definitely experienced that, hopefully in one of my classes. <laughs> Shirley's saying, yeah, no. So uh, most of your day is really being, uh, you're utilizing uh, the subconscious part of your mind. And the reason for that is it doesn't require as much energy to operate from. In the subconscious mind, good, Marissa's with me, Laura, Lori's with me. The subconscious mind is just a series of patterns, agreements, inset belief systems. And a lot of that is things that you actually don't consciously 
recognize on a daily basis. That's why we can know our core values. Like I, I'm very in touch with my core values are love, wisdom, and happiness. Now, are there plenty of opportunities where uh, I have a conversation or I say something to someone that is not in alignment with my core values of love, wisdom, and happiness? Absolutely. And it could be because there are subconscious agreements in place that I'm aware of that caused me to act in that way. So let me give you an, ex an, an example. The example that I have for you is think about parents that, you know, maybe you didn't have a lot of money and they saw other people around the neighborhood buying nice cars, buying nice things. And so the parents say to their children, oh, that person, they're so frivolous with their money. You know, they're, they're obsessed with material things. They're, you know, those aren't our people. They're, they're frivolous with their money. So as a child, what I'm picking up during these conversations that my parents aren't necessarily trying to specifically teach me is what the subconscious is picking up is, oh, when people spend money on things that my parents seem deem frivolous, like cars or jewelry or clothing or houses, they don't receive my parents' love. I know I'm, it sounds like I'm reaching a little bit, but this is the way the subconscious works. As a child, especially, and as, as an adult, we have an innate human need for love and connection. So the subconscious agreement, not the conscious, I'm not going through this in, in my like little three-year-old mind, but my subconscious is picking up, oh, parents don't like people that spend money on these types of things. They consider that frivolous spending. So uh, to make sure I continue to get love and affection and connection from my parents, I'm not going to become that kind of person. That subconscious agreement gets written into the pattern in our brain. And then years later, we're, you know, at the grocery store looking at, you know, the different prices on the shelf or for canned tomatoes. And we're going, oh, I don't know, that organic one, that, that's, that's $2 more. That's a frivolous expenditure. And not everyone does that. So uh, what that tells me is I do that because I had something in my past that taught me, hey, that type of expenditure, and that's frivolous. You don't want to do that. I made some type of agreement before based on my experiences or based on, um, um, I, I kind of call it like social education, social unconscious education. Because like I said, it's not like the parent was kind of sitting down with the purpose of, hey, you know what? I'm going to teach you to hyperanalyze every uh, purchase you make in the future. That was not their intent. That's not what they were trying to do. But the kind of unconscious education that came from it was, oh, you know, to maintain love in my life, I have to make sure that I don't spend too much money on frivolous things. If this is making sense so far and put makes sense in, into the chat. Oh, good. Awesome, Iris. I'm glad you're here with us. Yeah, William, you feel motivated after a class. Me too. Absolutely. Yes, 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 Jennifer, you're saying not really from a class, but if you socialize too much in classes all day, and um, if you socialize too much, that's my, maybe where you feel that numbness in the prefrontal cortex as well, which is great because what that says is that you are engaging the prefrontal cortex when you're, when you're engaging with people. Cool. We're good. We're good. So um, <clears throat> a lot of what I do as a coach and what a lot of coaches do is we try to find what are those subconscious agreements and what are those subconscious belief systems that are affecting how we perform our daily life. So um, these things, like I asked you in the beginning, are there certain things that you want to change because it'd be a good thing to change? I want to eat healthier. And let's just use that as an easy example because I think a lot of us feel that way. But we still find ourselves eating junk food. We still find ourselves not buying the right things at the grocery store. So why are we doing that? And the thing is, is it could have a lot to do with subconscious agreements we have with ourselves. Um, I just had a clone. <laughs> okay. So these 
the the book that really made this clear to me was this great book called the immunity to change and katie and we'll pop that into the chat for us it's called the immunity to change it was written by uh, lisa Leahy and robert keegan and this was a really incredible book that opened my eyes to a lot of things because what they did is they really studied why the body and why the mind has this immunity to wanting to change <laughs> yes jennifer cookies do taste so good and we should have them once in a while right and so uh, what Lisa Leahy and Robert Keegan did is they studied what are those resistances and they found that a lot of it came down to these subconscious agreements and commitments that we have that, like I said, they're subconscious, that you are not conscious of these things. So we keep running into these walls, but we call ourselves lazy. Oh, you're just being lazy that you're not eating healthy. Oh, you're just being lazy because you don't make this change in your life. When really what we're up against is things that are quite literally imprinted resistances to what might happen if we did those things. And so we're going to go through this because this I think this is really going to bring a lot of clarity into a lot of you. Um, let me bring this up on screen for you all to see. So... <clears throat> This is the model that they created to address this immunity to change. And we're going to go through this step by step. So if you have a piece of paper close by and you want to go through this, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper. I will give you a minute to do that. Um, but we're going to go through this piece by piece. And you are going to take something that you want to improve. It's some type of commitment that you have to improvement in your life. And you're going to go through this with me. I'm going to use my own examples just to give you the example, but you can do anything with this. So um, maybe you might use, I want to eat healthier. I want to um, be a better listener. I want to exercise more. I um, want to have better self-talk. So think about what you might want to improve on that you're committed to improving. Commitment is a good word, Wendy, yes. <laughs> okay, good, Deborah. So maybe that might be what you want to improve on is staying committed to that, right? All right, so here's what this looks like. In this first category, you know, where it says improvement commitment, what you're going to write in this category is what it is that you want to improve. So um, I'm going to use something simple and again, something that probably most people can kind of relate to. I'm just going to use, I want to eat better. But again, you can use this for things that are very, very serious to you as well. Um, I want to uh, increase my prices. You know, I know a lot of you watching tonight are hairdressers. And I know that that's something that people run up against really often is that resistance to doing the thing that they kind of know they need to do, which is maybe uh, raise their prices. So you might put that there in that, that first column, but mine's going to be eat better. So go ahead and place that into that firm first column. Yeah, you know what, Jennifer? That's something that a lot of people run into too. Jennifer says, I want to improve so much. <laughs> and that can be really overwhelming. So just choose one. And, and you know, maybe it's time to take a bite-sized chunk. Yes, Ashanti, you are worth more. Absolutely. So in this next column here. The doing and not doing instead. So this is very much exactly what it says. What are you doing or not doing instead of the thing that is here in the first column? So this column is what are you doing instead of this? Got it? So um, I might put in that column, I'm eating junk food. <laughs> I'm drinking beer. <laughs> so in the doing and not doing instead, it's listing out all the things that I might be doing or not doing instead of the thing in column one. So um, just take a second with whatever you're working on for yourself and put things into the doing and doing instead. 
So the race saying, I want to improve respecting boundaries and word vomiting might be one of the things you're doing instead of respecting boundaries. Good. I love it. Perfect. Perfect. Those are good things. <laughs> Ashanti, are you laughing at me because I'm eating junk food and drinking beer? <laughs> I can see Katie in the background too that works with us and she's chuckling to herself. Um, but so doing and not doing. So then the next phase that we go to is over here, which is we start to look at hidden competing commitments. So this is what this means. My conscious commitment that I want to have is what I want to improve. I have a conscious I want to be committed to eating better. But what the hidden competing commitment is, I have some other commitment that is stopping me from eating better. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to look at now. So within that hidden competing commitment, the first thing that is right here, the worry box. So this is really simple. If you go to column two, ask yourself what you would be worried about if you did the opposite of that. What would you be worried about if you did the opposite of what's in column two? And I know that might be a tricky question because, you know, again, we look at, okay, well, you want to eat better. So why would you be concerned about something happening bad if you didn't eat junk food or you didn't drink beer? But that's part of what is creating the commitment. We're concerned about that. That's right, Jennifer. There are beers out there that aren't that bad for us, right? <laughs> so in that worry box, I might take this one, the eating junk food, and I might say, okay, well, what is it? Let me kind of dig in. Let me be honest with myself. What is it that I'm worried about if I did the opposite, which is stop eating junk food? Well, I might be worried about not enjoy hmm? food. If I stop drinking beer, I might eat, feel my stress more. So I might be worried that I would feel my stress more, right? Yeah, surely it is a tricky question. <laughs> Jennifer, I love you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, Ashanti, good. So that that's a really common one, especially if your thing that you're working on is, you know, your pricing or communication or something that comes up really often. Like if I did the opposite of what I'm currently doing, maybe I'll lose love with people, lose connection, lose respect, lose friendship. So that's what happens in that worry box. So that worry box tells us what are we concerned would happen again? if we do the opposite of this. Yeah, good, Larray. not getting my say. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So what that tells us is we take these things within the worry box now and we turn them into statements of commitments. So here's what I am committed to based on my worry box. I am committed to enjoying food. Second one, I am committed to not feeling stress. Is that making sense? So Ashanti, I'm going to use yours just because I, I saw that first. Ashanti is saying that part of that worry box is losing a customer, right? That's, that's a very valid thing to be worried about. So what you would find one of your hidden commitments is, is to not losing customers. Cool. That, that just shows me a commitment. It's not that these commitments are good, bad, right, wrong, anything like that. It's just starting to expose to us these pre-existing uh, subconscious ag agreements that we have or commitments that we have that we were not aware of before. And again, it's really important to um, not judge these things as good, bad, right, or wrong. It's just seeing them for what it, what it is. Uh, good, I'm glad it's good timing, Deborah. That's awesome. Good eye opener, Shirley. 
Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just trying to keep up with your comments too. And thank you for being so interactive. This is great. So once we get here, now we have to start to look at what are the assumptions based on these agreements. So um, my big assumption, again, let's just go to, um, I am committed to enjoying food. So on um, now I recognize that, hey, there's a part of me that really loves to enjoy my food. Nothing really wrong with that, right? But here is where the big assumption comes in because what I'm assuming is that if, sorry, I'm gonna write it so you can see it on screen. If I stop eating junk food, I will no longer enjoy food. And if I go down to, um, if I use the one about feeling stress, my big assumption is if I stop drinking beer, I'm going to feel more stressed. Does that make sense? So we're, it's just a big circle. We're just coming back to the commitments, but it's telling us what our assumptions and our commitments are, what these agreements that we've made are so that we can start to look at them clear. Because, you know, I can quite honestly say this one especially feels quite true to me. Like when I say that, that, oh, my assumption is if I stop eating this food that I usually eat, that's kind of enjoyable to me, that means I'm not, I'm just going to stop enjoying food. Great. That gives me perspective that I can actually work with. Yeah, Cassie, perfect. Um, Cassie says, this is great. Comparing this to developing a new morning habit of getting out of bed an hour earlier on work days. That is a perfect, perfect example of this. So Cassie, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through that one really quick because I have a feeling that other people could relate to this. So uh, if we go here to the improvement commitment, what would go here in this box of the improvement commitment is I want to wake up an hour earlier on my work days too and you fill in the blank, whether it's meditation, exercise, being with family, whatever it is that you want to use that hour for. But that goes here into the improvement of commitment. So what goes here in column two is what are you doing or not doing instead? So probably what you're doing instead is sleeping in, or what you're not doing is setting an alarm, or what you're not, or what you're doing is hitting my uh, 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 snooze button. So that goes into this column. Then we start to say, okay, well, what would I be worried about if I did the opposite of that? So um, might be that I'm worried that if I do set the alarm, that I'm not going to get enough sleep. Okay. Maybe I'm worried about... Um, my worry box might be that if I do wake up an hour earlier, I'm going to mm, not enjoy the time that I'm spending in that hour. I don't know. I'm just kind of offering uh, suggestions on what might come up. So then we transfer that worry box stuff to uh, commitments. So that might equate to I am committed to getting lots of sleep. Okay, cool. That would transfer over here to big assumptions then. And the big assumption might be that if I actually wake up an hour earlier each day, and each of my work days, my assumption is I'm not going to get enough sleep. Cool. Okay. Now we have an, an assumption to work with. So if this is making sense so far, put yes into the chat. Oh, Larray, you're not the captain of the world? Come on. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, Shirley, exactly. That, that's what the, the whole purpose is. She said that this is a great way to peel away what stops you, pick a topic and pick it apart. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here is just kind of you know, continually pick pieces apart. And that's part of the coaching process is just continuing to ask questions, but ask new questions that we haven't asked before. 
Because again, I want to bring us back to one of the things that I very first said, which is very often what we find, and you know, Cass, I'm just going to pick on you because I can, because we love each other. Um, you know, I'm sure that Cassie probably kind of beats herself up a little bit about the fact that she's not doing that process of getting up each day. It's like, oh, man, see, you did it again. You let yourself down again. You know, you're lazy. You're this, you're that. So this also helps to put it in perspective where it's like, oh yeah, it's not about just being lazy. It actually has everything to do with the fact that you have some kind of agreement or you have some kind of commitment to something else that is literally stopping you from pursuing this new commitment, right? Uh, Deborah, you're saying still a little confused from my issue in the last two. So um, if you want, Deborah, pop, uh, let me come back and see if you had uh, already commented and what you're... Deborah, do me a favor, just pop it into the chat. What is your improvement commitment? And give me an example. Give me one of your doing or not doing instead, okay? So I'll, I'll keep going, but just pop that into the chat so far. Like, what is your improvement commitment? And give me just one of the things that you're doing or not doing instead. Jennifer, and that's the thing. That's what we like to tell ourselves is I'm lazy and I'm a procrastinator. Well, just telling yourself that you're lazy and a procrastinator doesn't really give you anywhere to go, does it? So my suggestion would be to let go of that because the other thing that telling ourselves that we're lazy and we're a procrastinator does is it keeps us comfortable in the stuckness. <laughs> Let me say that again. It keeps us comfortable in the stuckness because when uh, we talked about this in the beginning, one of the things that the subconscious wants to do is to keep you as comfortable as possible and as safe as possible. And change can be scary to the subconscious because it's already comfortable with the discomfort that you have. So it's more comfortable with continuing to kind of tell yourself, hey, you're lazy and you're a procrastinator, even though it feels like crap, it's comfortable with that discomfort because you've done it long enough that you kind of know how to deal with it. It's like, well, I can kind of put up with this. But what it's uncomfortable with is what would you be afraid of if you stopped telling yourself that you're lazy? What would it be afraid of if you stopped telling yourself that you are a procrastinator? If you did the opposite of those things, what would you be concerned would happen? That's the fears of the subconscious. That's where we're getting into those hidden competing commitments in here, right? And so we also have to be willing to let go of those things that we've told ourselves all the time too, right? Okay, cool. So I'm going to come back to Deborah here real quick. So Deborah's saying that in the first column, Deborah has, I'm just going to do it, do this real quick with you here, Deborah. In the first column, you're saying confident about prices. So that's the improvement that Deborah wants to make is to be confident about that pricing, right? Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up. So Deborah, I'm just gonna kind of, you know, just kind of fill in a couple things. And I, I'm not saying these are your things, but these are the things that I know as I've talked to many people people about being confident about prices. These are the things that are coming up. So uh, instead of being confident about prices, what you're doing or not doing eh, might be, uh, I'm, um, you know, I'm negotiating pricing. I'm not raising prices consistently. So let's just use those two as our examples because I think that those are pretty common. So um, what you're doing or not doing instead of being confident is you're negotiating or not raising consistently. And again, I'm not saying this is your because I'm just giving you examples. So um, let's use this one. If, if I think about what would be worrisome 
about negotiating or not negotiating my prices and staying true to them. If I stayed really true and I wouldn't, I, I never would negotiate with any client, what would I be worried about? That's what goes into this first box. So it might be as simple as like, well, I'm worried that I might lose a client or I might lose the respect or the connection with my client. Because, you know, we as hairdressers, we build these really tight relationships with our, with our clientele. So, um, yeah, it would be absolutely. I think that's a really common worry when people are um, not sticking to their guns with prices is that they might lose their relationship. And that is important to people. So let's use that as our example. So you're, you would put that here in your worry box. I'm worried about losing the relationship if I stop negotiating. So the hidden competing commitment down here would be that I am committed to not losing relationships. Okay, so that's where that would go, okay? So I am committed to not losing relationships. That's a hidden commitment that maybe you kind of consciously knew before. Maybe we kind of consciously knew that like, man, I really hate when people don't like me, that it's really uncomfortable. But now we can see it as is quite literally something that is built into the maps within the subconscious part of your mind is you are committed to keeping your relationships intact to not lose those commit those relationships. So now we take this and we turn it into an assumption. So the assumption would be, the assumption would be if I stop negotiating my prices, if I stay true and I stop nego negotiating prices, my assumption is that I will lose relationships. That's the big assumption. Is that making sense? That's the formula. Because now we can do something with these big assumptions. We can start to test them. And that I really like that when they wrote the book, they called it assumptions. Because that's what these things are. They're the stories that have been created over time based on our experiences and based, based on what we have seen out in the world. And there could be a situation out there that if, if we thought back in our history where we did see someone lose relationship or lose connection with another person based on money, right? Maybe it wasn't our particular situation. Maybe it wasn't about like a hairdresser or um, someone offering a service, but maybe somewhere along the line, we saw relationship, relationships deteriorate when money started to be discussed. So if we saw that, especially in the formative years, awesome, Deborah, I'm glad you're getting it. If we saw that, especially during the formative years of our life, it creates those subconscious agreements back there that, ooh, when people talk about money openly, relationships get lost. So then that puts me in the position to make a, th these big assumptions that, well, if I talk about money with my clients, that I'm going to lose the relationship. Kind of cool, right? I mean, not kind of cool. It's not great, but it's really neat how this stuff. Yeah, I love it. Ashanti just said, ah, yeah. And so when we see these things for what they are, sometimes even just getting to the place of seeing the assumption for what it is, is enough to start to shift our belief systems and start to shift our thinking. Ashanti says, mind blown. <laughs> good, Simone. I'm glad that this is, this is good for you. Good, Marissa. I'm glad you're loving it too. So I missed, uh, I just want to check because I did miss a few comments here. Yes, exactly. Ellie. The subconscious builds an image that makes us believe that that is how we need to operate daily. Perfectly said there, Ellie, because that's exactly what it is. And that's why it feels so true is because the image is built, the vision is built and it feels so true that it's really hard to not act that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, good, Catherine. So this would be a great one to go through with that is like your improvement commitment 
might be to have more boundaries with those people. So you could take that through this process. That's great. Yeah, absolutely, Jennifer. It could be that too. Good, good. Okay, so let's talk about the big assumptions because this is, this is where we get to start to experiment. The important thing is now that we understand that my big assumption, and let me come back to the one, the, well, actually, I'm going to stick with this pricing one because I feel like it's, it's probably more current for many of you. So let's go with this one, the I am committed to not losing relationships. So the big assumption that comes then is that if I stay true to pricing, I will lose relationship. So let's work with that one. The way that we change perception is to give better facts to the subconscious. We have to feed it new information because that's where it came up with this in the first place. These things don't just magically appear. They come from somewhere. And even if it's not direct experience, this is actually a really good point. <laughs> even if it's not direct experience, it could be just watching the messages on social media the types of news we watch, the television shows we tend to consume. Um, all of this stuff, the subconscious is kind of picking up on the periphery. So you're not consciously flipping through your Instagram feed and picking up information consciously. You're not looking at each person's post and going, hmm, okay, I'm going to embed this as a pattern into my subconscious. But your subconscious is always on 24-7. It's always picking up this information. So it might not even be just experience. It could be, uh, yes, Cassie, the people we surround ourselves with, so key, because they have so much influence, even if we're not consciously trying to absorb from them, if we're constantly around them, it's almost impossible to not take on some of their belief systems. So the big assumption, if I stay true to my pricing, I will lose French relationships. I would, I'd be willing to bet that most of you, when you hear that, it's like, oh yeah, I could see how that could be my assumption. I would also think that most of you probably go, and I kind of know that that's not true. Like on a logical sense, you kind of know that for the most part, is there the potential for it? Maybe, but on a bigger scale, most of the time, yeah, it's probably not going to be the truth, but that's the conscious mind. So what the subconscious needs is new experiences and new lessons. So this is where experimentation comes in. We have to give ourselves some type of experiment to try so that we can explore further into the assumption. So if, if my assumption is, if I stay true to pricing, I will lose a relationship. It might feel scary to run into the salon the next day, raise prices and stick to it across the board. So it might be that the experiment is you choose a few people and you say, you know what? I, I've been pretty lax with these one or two people. These one or two people, I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going to stay with my pricing. I'm not going to discount my pricing with these two people anymore. And I'm going to see what happens which I know is still scary because like the risk is even, you know, the, the thing that's scary to us is risking even one or two clients, right? But this is where courage also has to kind of come to the forefront because we have to take some courageous steps to test these assumptions. But what happens is with that first client and we, you know, get the courage up, like, you know, I know, I know that I've been discounting your services for a long time. I do have to stay on track with my current pricing. So the next time you come in, here's going to be your pricing. That's going to take a lot of courage to do on that one client. But when we do it and we get the response of, oh, yeah, okay, cool. That's not a big deal. Sweet. Okay, that gives us some kind of reinforcement then that the subconscious recognizes that the worst case scenario didn't come true. The worst case scenario story that it wants to tell us isn't going to be the truth. So 
that's where we have to start experimenting. And let's, you know, just jump up to the, the kind of simple one up here. If I stop eating junk food, I will no longer enjoy food. Pretty easy way to test this assumption. I just need to have the courage to say, okay, for the next three days, I'm not going to eat junk food. And I'm going to try to find other things that I enjoy eating. Great. This way I can test this assumption. And I might find things that I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, I still really enjoy this food, which helps to satisfy that subconscious need. So that's where we have to go into the experimentation place. Yeah, seriously. Um, I was just seeing Shirley's comment in there. Um, sorry, I'm just going back through comments to make sure I didn't miss anything specifically. Yes, and Lorray, this is also where the positive affirmation thing comes in too, is because we have to start telling ourselves a new story consciously. So like I said, the subconscious learns from our experiences and the things that we're picking up within our environment. So uh, let's feed the subconscious what we want it to believe. So it does actually work, those, those positive affirmations. Like, I am worth what I charge. I am worth what I charge. When I charge what I'm worth, people appreciate me. When I charge what I'm worth, people stay connected to me. It maintains relationships to value my work. You know, whatever it might be. But we're replacing the old chatter with, with new scripts. Exactly. Yes, you got a neck, you got a couple three day tests, Larray. Very cool. Very cool. Um, let me check on Catherine's here. That's really good. I have to actually work on reaching out to the right person or people to figure out what would be a great idea for my next adventure. Very cool. Yes, Catherine. And if you ever need, need anything from me, you're welcome to work, reach out to me. Uh, Cassie's saying, Andrew is saying how outside influences subconsciously influence us. If our goal is to be confident in our pricing and we're surrounded by people with confidence that stick to their pricing, they will have influence on us as well, vice versa. Yes, good point. I'm glad you brought that up because it does work in the opposite way as well in a really powerful way. You know, luckily, Cass, you, you work in an environment that that's very promoted too. Yeah, William, actually, absolutely. If you raise your two, two clients, leave, do the price increases you balance out, same money, less work, absolutely. And th that could happen too, William. I'm glad you brought that up because let's say you do raise the price and the experiment proves that someone does leave because of your price raise. Now that kind of hurts because it almost proves our assumption, but then we need to check in on the assumption again. And we need to check in on what the purpose and what the goal is. So um, the challenging thing is that if we're going to step into experimentation, we have to be open to the new information. The other challenge is, is to not let new information that comes in and be like, see, I told you, <laughs> I can't raise my prices because that one person left. It's like, okay, I guess I have to try this again and see what happens. And if I keep having the same result, let's say I do raise my prices on three or four people, and three or four people leave me, then I need to come back and I need to look at things again and say, oh, well, am I being too dramatic with my price raise or am I not, am I not providing the value for that pricing? You know, so it's all just information. It's just feedback for us to continue to grow and expand. Cool. So, um, Katie, will you pop that link into the chat one more time? Because I know it's pretty buried in there. We're going to pop a link into the chat here for you. That is the, if you go to this link, it is Harvard Business Press extracted this particular part of the book. So it, it actually walks you step by step, again, how to go through that process of column one, what's your improvement commitment? Column two, what are you doing and not doing? Number three, what are the hidden competing commitments? And then number four, what are the big assumptions? And then how to challenge those assumptions. In this link, it actually walks you through someone else's. Um, they, what do they call it? Um, 
they don't call it the map. Oh my gosh, I can't remember what they call it. But as they go through it, it's it's quite enlightening to see other people's process with it too. <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Catherine. I'm sure, thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, nice, Shirley. I'm learning to say that I'm sorry that they can't afford my prices instead of apologizing for raising my prices. That's awesome. Very cool. That's great. So I hope you all grabbed something from this. Um, I'd love to hear from you in the chat. What was your big takeaway tonight? What's one thing that you can take away from tonight and start to play with? I hope that you'll go to the link and, and um, you can print it out. You can also go to the immunity to it, or you can just put into a Google search immunity to change map. And there's tons of different versions of this, but there's lots of them out there that you can print out and you can take yourself through this in so many different directions. So I do appreciate you all being incredibly interactive tonight. I had a blast with you. 